The internet was not too happy with me there for a second. Do you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I thought I would share with you guys today, and I, I have a presentation, um, but what I thought I would share is really about planning for collision. So in my experience, right, my background, I started as a technician. I worked at a Nissan dealer on the floor, uh, worked my way up there, then went to a Chevy Hyundai dealer, and then ultimately got picked up by an automotive distributor and, and then worked for a manufacturer for many years. And they sent me to night school for um, business and got my bachelor's there and got my finance and things like that. And over... I opened my practice several years ago, but what's interesting or what I've noticed is that for most of the people that I've worked with in my past and the businesses that I work with now and everywhere in between, most of us um, that are in the industry never went to school for business. We never went to school for finance. Most of us are learning um, about how to run the business just by things that happen. Right. So what's interesting about that is that I, I think we all deserve the education and it should be more amenable. So my mission has been about creating financial literacy and just giving the information. Right. And I translate it similarly to like if your shoes untied, there's two ways you're going to figure it out. Either someone's going to tell you it's untied or you're going to trip. And things are very similar when it comes to running your business, because I think all of us would like to think that if we knew that we could do this or do that, we would do it. But when it comes to planning and financial planning, there's sometimes things that we just don't know it, so we don't do it. So the presentation I have today, um, it's really about the fundamentals of planning and just some of the basics. So for some of you, it might be below, for some of you, it might be above, um, but it's kind of hard, right? Talking to different people, understanding where everyone's kind of baseline is. So the content today, is meant to sort of just touch on a few different ideas and concepts that maybe you have or haven't thought about. And then from there, I've always made myself available. Um, I usually carve out an hour or two a week just for random calls that come through with random questions. So if there's things that maybe you see today that you're like, oh shoot, I don't know about this or I don't know about that and you want more information, I'll make sure that my contact information is available for you guys at the end so that if there's a question that maybe even you're not comfortable to ask in front of peers, um, you have the resource available and you have someone to at least ask the question because another firm belief of mine is that the only taboo subject left is finance, right? We will talk to our friends about so many other things, right? When you go out with your friends, you're probably not asking them what's in their 401k. You're probably not asking them what they have in their savings account. You're probably not asking what their mortgage payment is. And it's it's taboo and culturally indifferent for us to ask those things. So uh, hopefully um, this presentation will be informative and you'll get some ideas and things and how it relates to the business. So let me share my screen. Do, do, do. Can you see the screen, Lorraine? It should, it should say business planning for the automotive industry. We're good? Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Oops. Let me just move this over here and we'll get cruising. Bear with me one more second. There we go. So for most shops, right, I think it goes without saying that the technician shortage was an issue before COVID, right? Before COVID happened, finding really good staff, finding really good people was certainly an issue. And what's been interesting with COVID, and I've attended a few seminars recently, that all industries are starting to feel this pressure on workforce and finding good employees. Um, so that's certainly something that when I talk to different shop owners, that's definitely a concern. If your best technician leaves you, typically that's a loss to gross, gross revenue. It's typically going to mean that the owner maybe has to do a tire change or has to do a brake job that they didn't really feel like doing. Um, and as owners, you likely have to wear a lot of different hats. So I think when it comes to planning for your business, it's important to understand, you know, what are the things that are keeping you up at night? And can you build a plan to corral that, right, to, to make it easier or lessen the burden? Some of the things that we're going to talk about are 
really the four areas of concern for any business. We're going to talk about identifying and prioritizing goals for your business. We're going to talk about planning for the unexpected, the evolution of what is referred to as a business plan, and then the role of business advisors and the different people you know, in your space. So these are just some of the general ideas and topics that you'll get away from today's presentation. And then one of the things that I, I really firmly believe in is having an integrated approach to your overall business plan. So as it relates to you, the shop owner, right, there's different quadrants of your life that need planning, right? Your personal, it goes without saying that if your personal finances are suffering, it often will show up in the business. If the business finances are suffering, it often affects you personally. So there, there's a little bit of an intertwine between the two, right? And one can't really operate well without the other working well. So it's important that not only is the business plan for and those finances, but also your personal financial planning. How is your budget at home? What does that look like? You know, the finances of the business. I think, you know, in the 90s, I would say that for most automotive centers, it was okay to run your business just by looking at your checkbook. And as long as it was positive every month, sweet, we're good, right? Like no need to worry. And as technology has changed, as you know, more lines of code are added to vehicles and there's more procedures and different methods and ways of doing things and scan tool upgrades, the ability to be profitable in the business has changed and it requires us as business owners to be more shrewd with our finances and maybe look at your balance sheet or what is a balance sheet, right? You know, so these are the things that um, it's important to look at. And then also having an exit in mind. How long do you want to do this? And if, if there's an exit in mind, you know, how can you plan for it? How can we prepare the business so that in the future you have the opportunity to sell this maybe to your family or to, um, you know, a good technician on the shop floor, or perhaps, you know, a private equity or a third party buyout or a shop down the street. There's certainly all sorts of avenues that you can go in, but it's important that sort of all those quadrants are, are met and the people that are going to help you do that. It's important to have an attorney, an attorney, you know, that you can call if anything happens, whether it's a liability issue or it's the sale of the business. Um, it's also important to have a CPA, um, one that you trust, one that understands the business, one that understands your goals. And if your time horizon is 10 years before you sell the business, it might be a good idea for your CPA to know that so that they can prepare your books with that in mind. Uh, it's also important to have a really good banker. And it, I would say that when COVID hit and we had the PPP loans, that was certainly evident that, um, you know, when the PPP loans first came out and there was sort of this scrambling, we we're all trying to figure out like, oh, shoot, you know, what is this PPP loan? How do I get one? How does this work? Those who had relationships with their banker were the first in line to figure it out. And those that you know, were just another number at their bank realized quickly that they, you know, they wish they had had that relationship. And it's also important to have a financial advisor. That's what I do professionally, right? Someone that understands your finances, helps you plan with retirement, and that looks globally across the business and your personal, your personal finances. So with all four of those professions, I would say that it's important that you have those relationships now, even if it's something that you're like, I don't really need that for a couple of years. It's better to have the relationship already built up so that in the 11th hour or in that, that hot seat, when you really need the help, the person or the individual, the professional understands your particular situation and is already up to speed. So you're not playing catch up on top of dealing with a, um, a difficult situation. So it is important to have sort of that team of people that are there to help support your business. <clears throat> and then as it relates to planning, it shouldn't be a one size fit all, fits all, right? So for what works for one alignment business might not work for a tire shop, which might not work for a repair center um, or a transmission center. Some shops love to work with Highline, Porsche and Audi and Maseratis and other shops like to work with the Toyotas and the Corollas of the world. So it's fair to say and to assume that a plan, a financial plan is never gonna look the same for every single shop. It's always gonna look different. So don't accept a cookie cutter plan, make something that fits your dreams and your aspirations. And you know, one of the things that I think, you know, it's somewhat daunting and it's 
certainly when it comes to financial planning, it's always the 11th thing on anyone's list. I, I, and I realize this, I mean, even the topic now, maybe half of you are asleep uh, already, but really when it comes to starting a business plan, it doesn't need to be this, you know, grandiose thing. It can literally be as simple as sitting down and putting pen to paper and thinking about like, okay, I'm X amount of years into the business. These are my key people that I want in the business. This is how long I want to be in the business for. These are the potential suitors that could buy the business later. And then these are the things that maybe could become a problem. And for every business that might be different. For some, it might be logistical location issues. Maybe there's some developments going in nearby or building changes. Maybe you don't own your building and you wish you did. So thinking through a strategy that's gonna take you through the entirety of your business and having a roadmap, if you will, on how you're gonna execute over that time. There's a, a concept, uh, Hawth the Hawthorne effect, that I tend to really enjoy. And it, it talks about how, um, basically it was a study done in, I think the 1950s or the 1960s. And it talks about how it was this electrical company that had a study of people that came in and observed their employees. They were trying to figure out how to get more production out of their, their staff on the floor. And what they found in the study is that when all these people came into this electrical company and, and observed, they were wearing lab coats. And what's interesting is that the behavior of the employees changed because they were being watched. Because there was all of a sudden these new people in the shop, everyone acted different, everyone was working a little harder. And, and the analysis and the takeaway was what's called the Hawthorne effect, that when things are observed, things inherently change. So if you're observing your business and you're actually taking the time to put together a plan for your, your future of your business and what this is gonna look like, you inherently will just create impact, right? It's the same as if we were gonna try and lose 10 pounds this summer. If you hop on the scale every morning, you arguably might put that Twinkie down the next time you come across it. So same thing applies uh, when it comes to planning. And then things to think through, you know, the, the big, big things to think through are the risks, right? You know, oftentimes what I see in many shop situations is that you have maybe, you know, maybe you both worked at a dealership, it's a technician and a service writer that said, I don't want to work for this dealer anymore. I'm going to go open my own. You know, you want to open this with me? And, and then they pair up. Um, and there's certain risks that come from partnerships when you've got multiple business owners that are in pairing. And there's what's referred to as a, a buy-sell agreement. And it's an agreement that basically, if, there, if you happen to be in a situation where maybe you have a business partner, whether the business partner is active or silent, there are components within your partnership agreement where it should stipulate a, a buy-sell agreement or a sort of what, what happens if one of you passes away or becomes disabled. So thinking through those risks, or what about garage keepers insurance or things like that, you know, all the little things that in the beginning of business ownership, in that early startup phase, you're probably not thinking about because you're more worried about just getting business through the door. But at some point, you know, having a, a chance to sit down and say, okay, what are the things that potentially are going to get in my way of blowing this business up or building, you know, 10 more of these locations? How can we repeat this? And then retaining key people. Um, a lot of the, the data that I look at shows that Technicians on average generate anywhere from 200 to 400,000 of gross revenue for any automotive business. That's, you know, it depends. Are they paid flat rate? Are they hourly? Are they efficient? Are they, you know, sleepy dogs? It all sort of depends. But if you lose one or two technicians, it can create a, a significant effect to your bottom line. And typically, you see a dip in your gross revenue. So what are the strategies that you can deploy to retain your key people? Um, what's interesting is that I was reading an article in Forbes recently and I was talking about how it was some staggering percentage. It was like over 50% of the workforce currently in the U.S. is a millennial. And, you know, that's a staggering statistic. And I think it's something like 10,000 people are retiring daily right now, uh, which means that as the industry moves forward, as technology continues to increase, as the workforce is flooded with millennials, what are we doing to retain our people, right? Because what we did before isn't going to get us to where we want to go. And offering, you know, benefits used to be considered something of like, wow, that's incredible that you offer health insurance. It really was like shocking when shops would offer that. But I believe that as the time continues and we start to look at different things, you know, benefits and different things 
may become important to create the stickiness in the in the seat so that those toolbox wheels don't go rolling down the street for two dollars more an hour and there's all sorts of different components and things that we'll talk about that you can have a strategy to say okay if john doe is your asc certified technician he he knows the insides and out of how your operation works and you can't afford to leave you know lose him maybe have a plan around how to retain him for the longevity of your your ownership and then having a plan to exit. Um, exiting and, and leaving and selling a business um, needs to be well thought out um, because when there's an emergency and you have to, to sell it, it becomes a fire sale, which means that you're heavily discounting the value of your business. But when it's properly planned for and executed and you know arrangements are made and thought is put into it, you can typically get the, the best value possible out of the sale and it's mutually beneficial for all parties involved. So those are some of the things to think about as you're building out your business plan. And then, you know, also thinking through, you know, I touched upon it earlier about the buy sell agreement, having certain things. One thing that's often overlooked in, at the ownership level, oftentimes I will see owners have life insurance in place. They've got, you know, something there to offset whatever debt they've got within the business, but disability is often overlooked. That's something that can be, you know, a, a stalemate when it relates to the business. If, if all of a sudden you couldn't earn income tomorrow, what, what happens, right? What, what comes of that? Um, you know, sometimes we have people that own businesses that also have other jobs and, and they've got those benefits outside, which is great. But if you don't have those benefits, you know, what, what do you have in place that's going to protect you if all of a sudden you can't work? And, and it's fine if you can't work for a couple of weeks, right? If you're sick on the small end, but if you as the business owner, can't go to work for six months to nine months, who's going to do the job that you do all the time? Who's going to wear all those hats and have the same amount of passion that you do? It's always overlooked. And oftentimes I, I see that it, it hasn't been addressed. So for those of you that have, that's great. Uh, but it is something that I typically see doesn't ever get addressed. Um, and then retaining key people. You know, when when we can retain the best of the best technicians, it means that you don't need to find a new person. We all know how hard it is to find a good technician, to educate them, to get them trained, particularly if you're a specialty shop or you've got certain things that you really um, are you know, trying to master. If you've got that ace, it's really difficult to replace them, particularly in today's environment. You know, I often hear when it comes to investing in our technicians, like, oh, you know, if I pay for this training, what if they leave me next year? you know, for some other shop, the counter to that is like, okay, well, if you don't train them, what happens if they stay, right? Like we have to elevate our, our technicians in order to meet the demand of technology and, and the requirements of repairs and, and, um, and maintenance. But how do we retain people in a way that allows us to have peace of mind? And there's an area of, of planning that's referred to as a non-qualified deferred compensation, right? So most of you are probably familiar with 401k plans and healthcare and group life insurance and group disability and things like that. Uh, but there's another segment of planning referred to as non-qualified benefits. And that arena, it allows you to be discriminatory. So it allows you to pick your ACE, your executive technicians, right? The ones that are the best of the best. And it allows you to put money aside for them. And you can design these 11 which ways to, to Sunday. Um, but basically, these are technology, you know, uh, that or, or concepts that allow you to put money aside for John Doe and basically create a vesting schedule to say, okay, John Doe, I'm going to put money aside for you over the next 10 years. And as long as you stay, there'll be X amount of money for you in the future. If you leave, that money is, you know, the business owns it. So it's a uh, deduct deduction that the business takes years down the road when they pay out the benefit to the employee and it's taxable income to that employee. But it, it creates almost like the golden handcuff or this golden carrot that you can hold over that technician's head to say, hey, there's going to be a meaningful amount of money for you in 10 to 15 years should you stay with the business. We value you and this is something where, you know, we want to keep you for the, the future of the business. So what's cool in that is that you know, on a planning scope, 
my team, we do financial planning, everything from, you know, the lowest paid technician all the way up to the owner. And our mission has always been to create financial literacy. But what's interesting and what I've seen just personally working only with the automotive space, right, is that most technicians are not saving for retirement. Most, even if there's a 401k plan offered, won't in, engage in it. Um, so, it, and we're trying to change that. But if you as a shop owner can say, hey, look, I'm going to have 50,000 for you in 15 years, for many technicians, it's the most amount of money that they'll ever save. Uh, and it's meaningful enough that they will never leave you because it's there. So creating plans that are sticky, that allow you to strategically lock in the right people to the business so that you can kind of move forward and say, you know what, John Doe or Jane Doe, that amazing service writer I have, isn't going anywhere. And I'm fully confident that I'll be able to keep them with the business and be able to plan for other things. Right. So it, it almost takes that worry off your checklist as the business owner and allows you to start thinking about maybe you want to open another location or maybe you want to take more vacation. Um, but there are different ways to implement strategies that, you know, maybe you've heard before, maybe you haven't, but having a, a plan around it can help you do. So my computer just flashed so hopefully you guys are still able to see my screen you'll have to scream if not but um the, you can see it yeah we can see it okay cool i don't really know what happened there but my computer just kind of had like a little freak out so as far as it goes to you know planning for the business you know, having employee benefits, right? And and there's different ways of administering that. So for some shops, it's just flat out not in the budget, right? Maybe COVID was really, really brutal and it's just not there. Um, you know, some advisors will happily meet with your employees without any cost, right? Individual advisors can meet with your staff and you can provide that education where the employee can go off and get their own health care, their own life insurance policies, get their own IR. Uh, and, and allow your employees to plan for their own future without actually creating a burden. So there's different capacities that you can implement, right? And not all um, benefits have to be egregiously expensive. There's different um, healthcare brokers that can do like individual healthcare plans where you're just setting a fixed um, you know, copay, if you will, or like benefit per employee. Like, I think what's interesting about employee benefits is as technology has changed with, you know, the automotive industry, as have some of the benefits. So, you know, if you've been using the same 401k plan for years, or you've been offering the same health care, you know, it may behoove you to audit those plans and, and look at what you've got in place because there might be a more affordable way to do it or a way that's a little bit easier on your bottom line. And then, you know, back to the personal financial planning, one of the, you know, the interesting things that I see is, you know, for most of the people on the call, right, your shop might pay for your car payment. It might pay for your boat. It might pay for your RV. It might pay for your cell phone. There's a large area of gray for business owners where some of the personal expenses that you have are tied up within the business and vice versa. So when it comes to retirement planning, you know, coming down to that fine tooth number of like, what is the actual dollar that I need in retirement? Because if private equity knocks on your door tomorrow and says, hey, I'll give you 2 million for your business. It's like, well, I want the building, I want the business, goodbye. That might be amazing or it might not, depending on what you need to live. Um, you know, how long can you stretch out that payment? How, you know, what's the plan for the money after the sale? How are you going to stretch that money, um, you know, moving forward? And then, you know, what are the true needs that you have? Is your lifestyle going to be larger than, than it's been in your working life, right? Because you got to remember, you've got now seven Saturdays a week that you're going to be able to enjoy life. So are you going to spend more? Or are you going to spend less? Um, so having a really firm understanding of what you need, um, having an understanding of what social security will pay out, right? Um, and SSA, they used to send out mailers. So you used to probably get little uh, postcards in the mail uh, for social security, but they've gone away with that. And it's now on SSA.gov. And you can log in now and go direct and see what your payouts are for social security at, um, at your eligible 
age or deferred age. But having a firm understanding of what your personal needs are really will complement the overall understanding of where the business needs to go in the future. And then how I think of business, I think of business in really four different phases, right? So I think of startup, you know, that's usually the first, first year to the first five years. And that, when it comes to planning, we're mostly focusing on risk. We're largely reinvesting everything back into it to have it succeed. But we're thinking about, okay, what, what is the long-term vision? If you're a 20 year old starting your business versus a 40 year old just starting your business, there's typically different needs, right? If you're a 20 year old, you typically don't have that much personal debt. You don't have that much personal expense, but if you're a 40 year old, you might be married with kids and a mortgage and, and different considerations that need to be made. So understanding completely what your personal liability is and the business and how can we get this thing off the, the ground running. Um, and then at some point, after a few years of being in business, you're like, oh, I kind of got this. Okay, we're not going to fail. All right, I got it. And you might want to grow. You might, it might be a physical growth. You might want to add more than one location. You might want to add, you know, more tow trucks to the fleet. You might want to add a new alignment bay. You might want to, you know, expand in whatever capacity that you're looking to. Uh, or it might just be a, a matter of growth in terms of gross profit. But as you're looking to grow, you know, we're from a planning perspective thinking about like, okay, how can we attract the best of the best employees? Because the best of the best employees are going to give you better um, turnaround time on, on flat rate, right? If you're paying flat rate or hourly, right? We understand the efficiency of, you know, if a technician can produce 10 hours in two, it's good for everyone. So, you know, we're thinking about what are those uh, concepts and things that we could put in. We're starting to develop the exit plan, right? What's the proposed market value of your business in the future? Uh, if we keep growing the business at this current rate, what can we anticipate the value of this also look like in the future? If you don't own the building, maybe we're looking at how you can acquire the building over the next decade or two decades. Um, and then we're, we're thinking through continuity plans in case anything gets in your way. And then at some point in the business, you've reached a point where you're happy with the money you're making, you don't want any more locations, if anything, you just want more vacation and less headache. Um, and then it's usually at that point where, you know, we're reinvesting a little bit back. There's typically more cash flow. We're happy with everything. It's just about maintaining it. So that's usually the phase in which businesses are looking at a little bit more benefits, a little bit more robust planning. One, because the budget can afford it. And two, because you're just trying to maintain and sustain the good work that's already been built. And then at some point in your ownership, or maybe every day since day one, you're going to think about the exit. And when it comes to exit planning, you need to have a strategy. You need to identify all the potential buyers and weigh out which buyer is better than another, right? Um, some buyers, particularly when you get into private equity, they want to do a one lump sum and they want to pay you once and, and it's a one-time deal, which means that the taxation will be high. Uh, versus sometimes if you're going to sell to a family member or a technician, perhaps you choose to do seller financing where you hold the note and you hold that financed note over 10 years or five years and it allows you to spread out the payments and lower that income coming into your household each year thereafter. Um, and then the other part of it, you know, as you accumulate, um, what I see more often than not is that Shop owners love to invest in things that they can see. All of us, you know, I went to folk school, right? And I think I was very much the same prior to kind of going down this path. Most of us get into real estate. Um, and what's true about real estate is that it has a high value and it increases your net value. So the other part of transfer is thinking about your estate plan. Because, you know, as you sell the business, it just means that you're transferring one asset into a, a different type of asset, right? You're just moving dollars from one side to another on your balance sheet. But all in all, your future net worth could be affected. So we're also thinking through what, what potentially could you be affected with from an estate perspective if you want to transfer this off to your kids. Um, so that's a consideration as well. So, you know, some of the ideas and concepts, right, when we're looking at business planning, employee benefits could be retirement solutions, it could be um, employee benefits, it could be benefits just for those key golden handcuff people. When it comes to your personal planning, we're thinking through, like, do you have life insurance for your, you know, your spouse? Perhaps you're married and you're the only one involved in the business, but you have a spouse at home that's 
really relying on the income that you provide from the business. Um, you know, how are you going to accumulate and carve out wealth for yourself and for your family? You're working so hard to build this business. Are you putting enough away for your own retirement? The financial planning board says that you should save 20% of your income toward retirement. And that's great. You know, if you earn a hundred thousand of true income and you're maxing out your 401k, the, the annual limits currently in 2022 are 20,500. So if you're, you know, it works out, the math works out pretty much perfect that if you're, Making a hundred grand, twenty thousand five hundred is twenty, you know, a little over twenty percent of income. So it aligns perfectly with the financial planning board says to have twenty percent of income toward retirement. But where it gets tricky is if you're earning two hundred thousand of income and you're maxing out your four hundred one k, it dilutes that percentage to ten percent. If you're three hundred thousand and you're maxing out your four hundred one k, it dilutes it to five percent. So oftentimes what we see on the personal financial planning side is if your income's over a hundred thousand, that's where you really need to get a little bit more creative and start to create other buckets so that you've got more, you know, planning for your future. And then on the exit planning, do you have a proper business valuation? Have you looked at your exit strategies? Do you have a buy sell in case anything happens to ownership on, you know, the final years? And then do you have the liability that you need? You know, what if, you know, if someone gets into an accident based on the work you did, like, do you have all those risks protected? And then when it comes to exit planning, um, you know, there's certainly some considerations that need to be made, right? Identifying who those people could be, having the proper cash flow, because anytime you enter into an arrangement, whether it's a technician looking to buy you out and they're going to go to the bank or it's family member, typically what's immediately going to be happening is is they're going to look at the balance sheet, they're going to look at the PL, and they're going to look at the last few years of taxes. So understand that as you go into your exit, having the right cash flow is what's going to set you up for the most appropriate um, valuation and the most possible. And then, you know, retirement, right? Is what your business is worth enough to give you income in retirement? Or is it going to be too short? Um, so understanding what your need is independent of the business valuation is also an important consideration because sometimes those don't always align, right? The business is X, but you need Y. And then do you have control and timing under your belt, right? Do you have control over the month and date that you sell the business or is it up to, you know, the, there's no one that wants it and you're just desperate to sell it to whomever. Um, you know, typically I recommend if you're thinking about exit planning, you should start five to 10 years in advance of exit, at least start having a conversation with your CPA or state attorney and your financial advisor, and even your banker really to start thinking through like, all right, what are the things I, I haven't thought of yet that might affect this process? Um, you know, your state attorney can help you kind of navigate the taxation of the sale and what this means for your, um, your exit strategy. And then employee engagement, what's funny is that anytime I talk with a client and we talk about exiting the business. It's always whispered. It's never yelled, right? Like no one wants to like throw it out there. Like, Oh my gosh, like I'm selling the business this year because you know, the second the employees realize that the business is up for sale, no one likes change. Right. So keeping your employees on throughout the sale and beyond is a consideration to make, you know, what are the things that you've put in place to put glue in the seat so that beyond the transition and sale of the business, your employees, the key employees are going to stay all the way up through the sale. Because as we mentioned before, if you lose a key employee, it's going to affect your gross revenue, which is going to affect your valuation. Um, you know, family dynamics is another one. Um, I, I've seen more often than not people who've been married more than once and perhaps there's children from a prior marriage and children from the future marriage and navigating, you know, what child gets what percentage of the business or, or the the, the wealth that you have, or in other cases, I see where, you know, maybe the tow or tire company or a repair shop is like 90% of your net worth and 90% of your, your actual overall portfolio. And maybe you have one child of your family that's actually involved in the business and the rest of the kids have no interest, uh, which creates a whole dynamic into, okay, if, if you've had one child, you know, who's been involved in the business since they were a kid and wants mean for your other children that maybe aren't involved in the business if you're going to give all that value to other one child what are you going to do to to 
equitably distribute your wealth. And then, you know, there's certainly come, every uh, shop has its own complexity, right? We all have our own things that make our life unique and understanding what those things are and how to work around them. And then also from, you know, a taxation standpoint, you know, if you sell your business, that's a taxable event. So thinking through that and thinking through the risks that might, might affect you. And then there's all sorts of things that you can do, you know, in terms of, selling to your employees, right? So sometimes people will look at what's called an ESOP and that's where you literally gift stock, right? So you slowly distribute and it becomes a company owned company. Sometimes you may, you know, do a, a handheld note. Sometimes you might just divide the assets if there's two owners and maybe there's a difference of age. Maybe you just say, we're gonna split it 50-50 and walk away. Or you might do um, the that's referring to a, a supplemental executive retirement plan. It's a form of a golden handcuff plan, where maybe you you fund a, a technician's golden handcuff plan for 20 years, and then they take that payout in 20 years, and they go to the bank and they finance a loan and they they buy you out. So it's almost like a self-funded buyout. So there's all these different components in different ways, and there's no right or wrong answer, right? It really just depends on what you really are looking to do. Um, so it's important to understand that there's a variety of ways, even beyond what's on the screen, of how you can transition your business to who, who you want to. And then transfer to family. Um, there's all sorts of things that you can do to transfer to the family. So there's um, gifting, right? So you have the ability to afford gifts. So it's 15,000 uh, per parent to your child, right? So if you've got two children, that's 30,000 per kid that you can gift to your kids. So that might be in the form of stock shares or stock certificates that you're gifting to your children over time. And, it, and it's a use it or lose it situation, right? So if you don't use it in any given year, it's not like you can retroactively do it, but it, it is a way for you to slowly defer the value of your business on to your heirs. You can also have it where it's transferred upon your passing. You can do what's referred to as an irrevocable life insurance trust, where you have estate planning done that it, it really transfers all sorts of assets upon your passing. That's where an estate attorney has to come in. But there's all sorts of ways in which you can artfully transfer the business to your loved ones or transfer your assets, your retirement accounts, whatever they may be, onto your family and loved ones. And then, you know, sometimes there's people that, that don't have kids or, or they hate them <laughs> and they don't let them have anything um, or, or they think that they should have. Um, sometimes I, I get the, the phrase of, you know what, I worked hard for my money. I want my kids to work hard. I don't want them to have anything. So there's other ways to, to donate to charity. Um, there's certain charitable trusts where you can actually reap the uh, taxation benefits of giving your, your assets now while you're living. So you basically assign all of your assets to charity now while you're living and you basically say and pledge that all right, upon my passing, all of my assets will go to this charity. And because you're doing that, you're actually afforded um, discounts in your, your living years on your taxes. So there's different strategies there, um, which can also be helpful. The other thing is, you know, third party. I think private equity, from what I've seen across all segments of, of like the automotive umbrella has started to tick up in the last two years. So since COVID in salvage yards, collision centers, automotive centers, um, dealerships, repair centers, I've seen private equity start, you know, really kicking the tires on things and looking at what's going on. So that might be something that you're in the middle of entertaining, right? Um, so it's important to understand, you know, what, what does that look like? Are they willing to pay out over a period of time? Are they only willing to, to pay it in a one-time uh, payment? You know, how is this all going to look and what, what makes the most sense for you? But, you know, on the focus of retaining your employees, sometimes, you know, if you have those golden handcuff plans, you can negotiate. It's a bartering tool and part of the negotiation for you is you're transferring your business. You can say, hey, look, we've got two employees that are golden handcuffed to the business that we've designed these plans. We would like you to honor them. You know, if we sell the business to you, you need to honor these plans for the, the remainder of those agreements. Or perhaps you cash them out and you give them to the employees upon the sale. Sometimes there's the ability to do 
stock options for your employees and all sorts of different strategies and, and different techniques to make sure that the employees that you want to keep on stay with you uh, throughout the future. So, you know, a few things to note, buy sell agreements. If you have a partner in your business and you have a partnership agreement, please make sure that you have a, a buy sell arrangement within there somewhere, whether it's an operating agreement, partnership agreement, make sure that there's something there and that you have life insurance and disability insurance to amend that. And then do you have something to protect against loss of employees? What types of strategies do you have to make sure that your employees are, you know, with you? And then, you know, when's the last time you looked at your operating agreement, right? So these are all things to kind of think about as it relates to just planning for the future of the business. So, you know, beyond today, I'd love for us to stay connected. My cell phone number, it's 603-718-4363. My email is there and you can find me on all sorts of social platforms, but I'd love to stay you know, connected with all of you. Um, you know, if there's um, questions that you have or um, any way that I can help, you know, please don't uh, hesitate to reach out. We really do try to make ourselves available as much as we possibly can. Um, but I think as it relates to planning for your business, it's just so important to kind of, um, start anywhere. There's no, you, you can never start too late. And even, you know, I'll put it this way. If you put a dollar away now for every day until you retire, it's considerably more money than if you didn't. So thank you again. And Lorraine, thank you so much for having me. I, I really, you know, I'm really so pumped to be with you, this group tonight. Uh, I hope that you guys got some ideas or maybe it made you think about things a little bit differently. Um, and that's pretty much it folks. Awesome, Rachel. Anybody have any questions? I think you're pretty thorough. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of great information. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I was I was enthralled by it. I was taking notes just really hard. So that's really good stuff. Oh, cool. That's nice to hear. Thank you. Yeah, I could see that being a really good like regional kind of evening event in person somewhere, you know, for us, I thought it was uh, very informative. There's a lot of different silo, you know, I tried to connect, it's very like high level, obviously you could go into the weeds with any one of those subjects and there's a lot of content. The golden handcuff thing is really fascinating if you go down that rabbit hole. Um, but we have, um, I built like a, um, it's like a, a case study, if you will, of like what it would look like to do like a full estate plan for a, a automotive shop and like, you know, how that actually looks or what like a financial plan looks like that way. Uh, that's been kind of cool to, to really show like this is what it would look like if you were to plan for your business. Um, and it's usually relatable. It's, it's, you know, textbook auto shop type stuff. So more often than not, people look at it and go, oh, that's me. <laughs> yeah. Now we're up to four products with her and looking at a fifth. Well, that is awesome. Can you send me the slide deck that you used to the- um... Yeah, I should be, yeah, I should be able to, yeah. Okay, if you can do that, that'd be great because I can just take that last image and, and share it like with a thank you post or something tomorrow too. So, um, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks guys. It was, I, I hope uh, you all have a great evening. It was nice to meet you guys. And if you need anything, holler at me. I'm happy to help. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Bye, guys. Bye. Good night.